is is shouting and super easy to track down. So um, this is a de-authentication attack, and we'll talk a little bit about it when we get there, but of all the things we're going to go over today, this is the one attack that I will ask you to please not run on any devices here, including your own. You are free to do this in your own home, on your own devices, but the library has asked us explicitly to please not do this. So why is this different? We're gonna be messing with Wi-Fi in all sorts of weird ways. We're gonna actually make our, our own devices misbehave, uh, and we wanna understand why that's happening. But when we cross the line is when we're denying someone's service or otherwise interrupting their ability to connect to something. Now, um, there's a lot of stories that I cannot tell you as to why when you start messing with things in the wild, um, you just end up accidentally disconnecting important stuff. Um, so the message here is you might not know that there's a hospital or like an IoT medical device that is dependent on some sort of link that you messed up. And like I said, this is an extremely obvious attack that any networking person can figure out what happened and who did it. It's not hard to figure out. So um, I don't want to give you guys a loaded gun and have you fired off into a hospital. Like, because li literally you can disconnect traffic control devices. You can uh, disconnect critical infrastructure with this attack and it is not subtle whatsoever. So we'll review. The authentication attacks are off the table because their fundamental purpose is to kick a device off the network. At home, feel free to practice on your own devices, but please do not do that here because the rest of our attacks are either passive or manipulate a device into doing something that doesn't disconnect them from the network. And thus they're permissible. Any reconnaissance thing that's purely listening, you're free to do wherever you want, but anytime you're interacting with a networking device, just take a moment to think, if this were something really important and it got disconnected and someone figured out I did it, how bad does this look? Blasting a specific device with de-authentication packets is as malicious as you can possibly look as a beginner, so please do not put on that face in the Missoula Public Library. Um, any questions about that? And this is, I don't mean to intimidate that you, I want you to try things, but I also want you to understand where the limit is and where, if you find any other beginners who are getting into this and they're like stoked to press the button on this like cool Wi-Fi hacking tool, you should let them know where, especially in a managed environment like a school, a library with a really nice budget and friendly IT staff, like where you would very easily kind of be discovered and like where they would want to have a word with you. So um, <laughs> that's the line and we won't probably be doing anything else that like kind of touches up against that, but please uh, be mindful. So let's go ahead and get started. Everybody should have a nugget now. Um, as I said, this is a cat shaped microcontroller board that's supposed to make this microcontroller as accessible as possible without needing any additional stuff. So when it starts up, it should automatically show a little face, do a little scan that identifies any nearby Wi-Fi networks, and it should give us some results. And at that point, we have a number of different options. So go ahead and get yours plugged in. We're gonna go around and make sure that everyone's at least like lights up and was flashed properly. And if you want to run like the scan function, you can go ahead and do that. Theresa, if you don't mind, I'm going around and Yes, uh, the cable included in all the bags uh, supports uh, data, but uh, you know if you don't have a USB slot, then you can use any cable that supports data. Yeah, it's right. Don't you love the design where the NeoPet feels directly in your face? <laughs> yeah, we're working on that. We need to uh, change the ability to affect the brightness of that LED. Because you're in a dark room and you're like, I'm, I'm blind. I can't see anything. Okay, I'm going to give like 30 more yeah. seconds or so. And then if you've got a nugget problem, please raise your hand. If everyone's achieved a nugget solution, keep your hand down. that everyone's nugget is now blinding them with a, with a neopixel to the face. Cool. <laughs> so this is the deauthor. Some of you might have heard of this. This is a very, very popular program that is all over AliExpress. There's wristwatch deauthors. There's like stupid like other ones. They, the, the designer has really gone ham. And what's kind of behind this is there's a, a developer that has made this program and it's open source. And there's a manufacturer in China who makes it in all sorts of different form factors. And some of them are pretty crazy, but I always thought that the wristwatch was a really, really interesting one because it allows you to scroll, allows you to select, it actually allows you to do like 25% of what this chip is actually capable of. 
So what's interesting about this version, it is, is, it is designed to be as beginner friendly as possible. That is why I have seen it in countless maker spaces, in countless computer science classes with people that like think I don't know what it is. You know, like, like de-offing something or otherwise like messing with Wi-Fi. It's really, really popular and it's been banned from a lot of hacking conferences because people can't run Wi-Fi based things without people being like, oh, watch this and attacking it and then ruining something for someone else. So it's really been uh, associated with bringing Wi-Fi hacking down to the lowest common denominator where anybody who has like $12 on AliExpress can buy one of these and really cause a big disruption. So I was friends with the developer of that open source software and I said like, hey, as a Wi-Fi hacking person, I know you're trying to be user friendly, but what if just like forget the screen, forget the backdoor like cool Wi-Fi interface, which by the way, if you want to right now, there is a uh, wireless access point called Home, which each one of these is creating, which allows you to connect and run some of these attacks from a web interface, from any device that has Wi-Fi. So you can take your phone and connect it. The problem is all of your devices have the same name right now. <laughs> so the likelihood that you log into your own nugget is exceedingly low, but <laughs> The point is, if you wanted to, you could have this device and you could log into it on your phone and it has a slick web interface and you can run some basic attacks. You can run scans and, and that's really cool. But I wanted to see if we could push this further and that's kind of what we're going to look at today. We're going to be using the advanced version of this, which is command line, but allows us to do some really cool stuff. And it's a trade-off. Now this little microcontroller cannot handle providing both like a web interface and running advanced Wi-Fi attacks like phishing. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna flash it with a more advanced version, and this is what we've been working on for the last year is making this easier. Uh, and we're going to learn how to run some of these interesting Wi-Fi attacks and see what it does to our devices so that we can adopt some better Wi-Fi habits. And some of that is going to be like deleting open Wi-Fi networks stored in our phone. That doesn't seem like a big deal, but in like 30 minutes, you're really gonna <laughs> wish that you didn't do that. <laughs> so let's go ahead and take a look. So in order to get started with the advanced version, so you can always go back to this version of the author. It's friendly, it's beginner, it, it does some cool stuff, but oh, we're gonna do way more interesting things with the new version. So if you want to navigate to nugget.dev, N-U-G-G-E-T dot dev, this is the flashing website that is going to allow us to put all of the different available software onto our Nugget device. So once your Nugget is plugged into your computer, and you're on this website in an approved browser, and if, uh, Ariza, if they see a big red banner on the top, what does that mean? It means that you're not using the right browser. That's right, it means that you're not using the right browser. Yep. And you should be using uh, Chrome, Edge, or Opera. Thank you very much. So, uh, go ahead and navigate to this, and we're going to practice putting a project onto the microcontroller. Now, there's a lot of other projects that will run in this microcontroller. One of them that we're going to be doing for an upcoming cybersecurity camp is basically a smart LED controller. So you can have like TikTok lights in your bedroom using this like open source device. So technically, you can actually take your nugget and flash it with WLED, plug in a NeoPixel strip and control it. It's just one flashing process away. So what we're gonna teach you here is the process that basically every microcontroller uses to load one of these open source projects. So it really lowers the bar for anybody that wants to try this kind of stuff out. So first up, it says connect your nugget. I don't have a nugget, can you? Actually, I, I'm gonna grab my prop nugget. Thank you very much, Michael. And if you're doing this from home, the number one, see, that's why I put this, so I didn't unplug it. Um, the number one problem is a cable that doesn't support data. There's lots of HDMI mini cables out there, or micro HDMI cables out there that, USB. yes, thank you, that uh, do not properly support data, they only support power, and sometimes you'll have a one that supports data that suddenly stops, and you're like, wow, the microcontroller's broken, it's not working, and then you'll switch cables and it will start working. Michael is the person you can thank for five of you, like ha not having this problem, because he decided to include these cables just so that we're 100% sure all of you have working ones, so a round of applause for Michael for not <laughs> cool. So go ahead and plug in your 100% tested and working cables. And assuming you have USB. Assuming, yes. Um, <laughs> and you should be able to click on connect your nugget and a little serial window up here will pop open. Uh, if you have like 30 of these, the fastest way I've found to go through them is to like, you know, plug it in, press the button, see which ones are there and then unplug it and try again, see which one's gone. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty dumb and simple, but in this case, I only have three, and it's pretty obvious it's not a Bluetooth device. It is the last one, which is a USB serial device. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit connect.
And what we should see if the device successfully connects is this. So we now have a drop down menu of all the available programs that will run on, well, all the currently supported uh, programs that will run on the Wi Fi Nugget. And the one we're going to work with today is the very last one, the ESP8266 eAuthor. So this is the advanced command line version. And I'm going to go through and show you guys how to flash it, so don't try it yet. Um, but uh, if anybody's having a hard time connecting their nugget, like getting it to this page, I'm going to give you maybe like another minute or two, and then raise your hand if you're having an issue, and either Ariza or Michael will help out. I, I like, don't believe it. No one has an issue? Okay. You're liar. Okay, cool. All right, we'll do it. Okay, so I'm assuming now that for some reason in uh, a demo of this many people, our hardware is working with Note Plus. Confusing, but we'll, we'll, we'll accept that. Um, so you are now directly connected to the microcontroller and you can do two things. And you should always erase a microcontroller before uploading new code. Why? Because otherwise you will think that there's ghosts in your house or something. The, the reason I say this is there will be leftover code that will continue to run like making weird access points that were like part of your old code that you don't understand why they're running and that usually happens if you don't erase it first. So wiping the memory of the microcontroller, make sure there's no remnants of old code that are gonna come back to haunt you. So go ahead and hit erase and hit okay. And the friendly code that's currently running on your nugget will be fried. You will be erasing its brain. It's a good thing though, because we need to get rid of it. So when it is done, you will see finished. Took however many seconds to erase. If your nugget takes a really long time to erase, it's probably fine. These things, I, the core of it costs like $1.80. That's just the way it goes. Um, but eventually, after a minute or two, it should say finished, took however many seconds to erase, and at that point, we can hit the drop down menu and select the ESP8266 author. We're 90% done <laughs> with getting the setup. Um, so if you haven't considered these before, or you thought they're too complicated, if, if you're like struggling right now, then we're here to help you, but I think that you can do this, I believe in you. So the next step, and the only next step, is to hit program uh, after making sure you've selected the ESP8266 author, and you'll see a little progress bar start creeping along the side here. But I also wanna give a big shout out to our volunteer, Angelina Sosobi, who made this flashing website and made this process so easy for you. Um, there's a lot of open source programs that do this, but she combined this all into one, and it's really thanks to her that this class is gonna go so smoothly. So we've had a lot of volunteers who have like helped out to make this very friendly, and Angelina has done a great job. Because previously there wasn't this progress bar, and you just had to sit there and have faith that something <laughs> was happening. <laughs> and I kind of figured out you could like right mouse click and see the see it like loading like in the like code, but like you couldn't actually see it on the screen. So just that psychological reassurement that like you're doing the right thing is very relaxing. So I'm assuming all of your nuggets are still flashing as well. If anybody gets a weird output, um, last night I demonstrated this to the night auditor at our hotel, and it just crashed. It wouldn't work, and I reflash it, and it it just started working immediately. So sometimes it just doesn't work the first time and you don't learn anything. It's not unusual when computers get down to this price range. Um, so don't be discouraged if it either hangs for a long time or if you just need to try reflashing the second time, it is very normal. Um, cool, so now we're at the end. But the same program appears to be running. What's going on? Well, the instructions are right here. We need to reset the device in order to run the next piece. So. Do not do this until it's done flashing, or you'll have to do it all, all over again. But when you see that it's done, it uh, tells you how long it took to write the bytes, and then it tells you to reset your device. It's time to unplug it and plug it back in. And when you do, you should not see anything on the screen, because now we're directly connecting to the microcontroller, and it literally doesn't have time to do screen stuff anymore, because we're gonna be asking it to do a lot of bad, bad things. Powerful things. Powerful things, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's only bad if you use it that way. Yes, it's only bad if it's inconvenient, I guess. Again, if you're having any issues. Yeah, don't please. Be so the, the format of this is a conversation. If anybody has a question, if you're lost, if you're curious about how this applies to other things, if you're wondering if you can take like a Wi Fi light bulb out of a socket and flash this to it and then use it as a Wi Fi attack platform, the answer is yes. <laughs> it actually does work. Yeah, about like 50 to 60 percent of IoT devices use this chipset. Yeah, which is really cool. Because imagine you like take a light bulb, you flash it with this, just this easy, and then you like plug it into like someone's like home or something. You could be, I mean, it wouldn't work as a light bulb so well, but you could be connecting it to it remotely and having it do malicious things from inside someone's home. 
that's why these microcontrollers are important. Like they're really cheap and they're really powerful and they're found everywhere. All right, so I don't see any hands, so I'm gonna assume that you guys are done flashing. You've unplugged your nugget, you've plugged it back in, and you don't see that LED blinding you anymore. That means that it is now in serious Wi-Fi hacking mode. This is currently its final form. So, in order to interact with this, we used to have to have people use like the serial terminal, and everybody had a different operating system, and some people had like BIOS options enabled that like prevented us from doing this, and I learned so much about BIOS that I never wanted to know. Um, that instead we decided to use a serial terminal yet again. So what's nice about this is it will use the same process we've already been using to communicate with the microcontroller. So the website we're going to go to for this is serial.huhn, which is chicken in German, um, dot me. So this should be what you see. And let me pull up the link a little larger. So this is going to allow us to directly connect to the microcontroller and work with the functions that it has to interact with Wi-Fi. So when you go to serial.huhn.me, you can click on connect, and then connect to the microcontroller the same way we did before by selecting it from the list of serial devices. Again, if you have a hard time finding it, you can just unplug it, plug it back in and see which one disappeared. If you get a successful connection, it should look like this. And if you're here, then you can skip ahead a little bit by typing help, H-E-L-P, and taking a look at all the available functions we're gonna be working with today. And this is gonna be the core of our curriculum. At this point, you guys are set up. You've taken a microcontroller from scratch and flashed an offensive Wi-Fi hacking program to it. So now you're gonna learn how to defend against it now that you see how easy it is. So I'm gonna type help. There we go. Chicken. I will, I will, I will. So if you type help and nothing pops up, please raise your hand. This is the, there we go. Fine, please. I thought you guys were lying to me. Like it's never been this smooth before. Ariza has been deployed. Um, so yes, sometimes it will go silent on you. Um, so this is a list of all the different functions that we have access to when we're looking at messing with Wi-Fi. So, um, raise your hand if anybody here is uh, like a networking major or like works with networking a lot. Um, okay, cool. This is going to be super familiar to you um, because we're basically getting raw access to a lot of this networking stuff that usually just like edge cases or quirks and exploiting them to be really annoying. So some of the stuff we're going to go through today also has further write-ups on them from the person who made these guides. So. Just as a reference, if you want to take a picture, write it down, whatever, these are some more specific guides covering all the different functionality available in each of the commands we're going to cover today. Now, because this is a Wi-Fi self-defense class, I'm not going to come at this like, you know, these are all the ways you can mess with the network. Instead, we're going to look at the way that these commands can interact with our own devices. So we're going to be targeting our own laptops, phones, like whatever else, and seeing if we can get them to interact in weird ways and seeing what kinds of things hackers can do if we join like a weird Wi-Fi network or have a bunch of weird networks stored in our phone. All right. Page unresponsive error. What was that? I got a page unresponsive error with a terminal. Interesting, Michael. Or Marisa, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, Thank you. OK, so let's start with a scan. Now, a scan is going to return two different types of results. Because when we're talking about Wi-Fi, we're fundamentally talking about two different classes of devices and that's access points, things like routers, a phone's hotspot, the library's repeaters that make a unified network appear on our phone, um, and then devices that are connecting, clients. So these are phones, laptops, IoT devices, anything that is connecting to a Wi-Fi network and kind of taking down data from it. So we're going to be able to scan for either one. And the other important thing to know about Wi-Fi is that in the United States there's 11 channels. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. 11 or 12? I think it's 11. Yeah, so because of that, when we run a scan without any arguments, if we're not specific about saying what we want to scan, we're actually gonna be skipping between, between 12 different channels and we're gonna pick up little fragments of conversation. So when I first teach people this, they can be a little bit confused about, like when I run a scan, I don't see anything. Like this actually happened to Ariza when we first got started. She thought, hey, uh, and she thought that like it might be broken perhaps, but instead if you stay on a particular channel for longer, uh, you start to see all the traffic on it. So 
we'll start to use the different arguments available for a scan to be able to get better and better at detecting devices. Because I think you're gonna find when you just run a scan with that, without being specific, you're gonna get kind of terrible results. So let's go ahead and run a scan without any argument. Just type scan, and what we should see is it's going to skip between channels. So it's gonna go from channel one all the way to 14, but it's passive, we're just listening, so it's okay. But we're not gonna get much action in the United States on channel 13 or 14. Nothing's gonna be broadcasting there, unless we're by an airport, and maybe we'll hear some like radar or something. Um, so it's gonna continually scan, and the results will come in. And first we can see a lot of microcontrollers. That's all of you. <laughs> the other thing we can see that's kind of interesting is vendors. So vendors are a piece of information we're able to get about devices around us when we do a Wi-Fi scan because the MAC address of all these devices that we're reading is actually derived by the vendor. So this program is able to look at specific vendors and be able to determine like who made the device, which makes it a lot easier for targeting things. Like a, a MacBook Pro is going to look a lot different than an IoT device, for example. So vendors are a really important part of being able to interpret what we're seeing in a scan. And here, we can see very clearly that the library has all kind of the same infrastructure deployed here. It's all the same vendor, which is to be expected. But we can see that like the library is managing all these different access points. Now what's interesting is, um, this is a little bit different from what we see on a phone. So if we were to just open our phone and do a little scan and see what's available, we wouldn't see like multiple Bitterroot library access points. We would just see one. And this is one of the ways that as an attacker or a hacker or someone who look, is looking to mess with Wi-Fi, we can start to either slip under the radar or have a device connect to us that shouldn't. So when you're connected to an open access point, your device is basically a, like this, that has multiple nodes. It's usually for a really large setup, like a library with multiple floors or a school uh, that needs to have the same access point all the way across. If we create an open access point with the same name and a slightly more powerful signal, most devices will not know the difference between our malicious access point and just another node on this network. So this is a useful attack because we can have somebody who's on like an open access point like this or something that we know the password to, take a look and see the network is configured like this. It has a ton of nodes on it and nobody would maybe notice if we just make another node and make it super strong so people automatically connect to it. It's weird, but your phone will make this decision without asking because it wants to give you the best service and it assumes that you know, you're in a school or a library and that's the way these sorts of networks work. So making observations about the network is the first step to any attacker kind of assessing how they would manipulate a phone into doing something that it shouldn't be doing. And in this case, it's one of the risks for Wi-Fi self-defense, tying it back to that, uh, is when you're in an environment like this and it has all these nodes, you don't necessarily know, especially if there's no password or way to authenticate, that it is really the access point you need to join. There's very little way of being able to tell as a consumer because that's just the way that Wi-Fi behaves. It's kind of a quirk and it's designed to be a convenience function, but in the end, it's an attack vector for people who want to create a node on this network, like the Bitterroot library, and convince devices to join and maybe sign in if uh, it's able to prompt a login or something like that. So just from our scan, we're able to see information about the structure of this library's network. And of course, we would never do anything bad to the precious library. But for anybody using this tool, it allows us to immediately kind of assess, like what is the attack surface, how many access points are out there, and what is the vendor that's powering all of this. Now what's funny is this is almost facilitating of like a digital burglary. Like if someone was rolling through a neighborhood looking for high-end stuff, this is why having your Wi-Fi like turned up as powerful as possible so like you get great reception also is a risk because if you have a lot of really nice stuff, that's IoT stuff or like entertainment stuff, um, people can literally roll through and see like through the walls and effectively be able to identify the vendors. I can't go into too much detail, but there was some, um, yes, uh, adult products that decided to use Wi-Fi and they had a very specific vendor. And you could build a detector and literally pinpoint where these were distributed in terms of who had purchased one, which was very embarrassing, obviously. But another thing that we have to worry about even from a passive scan, and again, this is just listening, this is all completely legal, there's nothing wrong with this. And in fact, like people who like war driving, which is driving around and geolocating uh, both clients and access points, think this stuff is hilarious, as do I. Um, <coughs> so, so far, we can also see we have some clients. Now the information we see about the clients is a little bit different. These clients are associated so we can see that they're actually connected to the Bitterroot library. I imagine this is some of you. Um, so 
there are a lot more of you here than we're seeing, obviously, and some of that might be accounted for by you automatically connecting to the five gigahertz network. In fact, I would bet that a lot of your devices automatically selected that. But this is like a whole last library. Like obviously there's gonna be more people or more devices than we're seeing. So how can we do a scan better? Well, that's where we can start looking at the actual command itself and start using some of the optional arguments to do a better scan. So I'm gonna type help scan. And what that does is it'll give me all the information I need about that particular command without outputting absolutely everything. You know, like we, we don't need to see that whole help menu every single time we have a question. So in this case, we can see that we can manipulate whether we're scanning for access points or stations, and we can set the amount of time that we spend on the scan. Another thing we can set is the channel. So why would we be scanning channel 13 and 14? It, it makes no sense in the United States. They're, they're not used. So we're just wasting time on the scan when we're doing that. And then we can also set this CT. So CT is channel time. It means how much time do you spend on every individual channel. If it's like a full two or three seconds, you're probably actually gonna get most of the devices that are connected to that network. So you're probably gonna see a lot better performance using that type of scan. Um, R, dash R is to retain, it just means it stores the information. So let's go ahead and do a scan. But I'm gonna go ahead and do, uh, let's see, dash T, 30 seconds, and dash CT, channel time. Uh, it looks like this values in milliseconds, but I've seen from experience you can also put like, I think like 1S or 2S, and it interprets it as one second or two yeah, seconds. One second. I'm gonna try it, 1S. Um, so I'm also gonna say dash C for channel and say I wanna scan from channel one to 11. And let's see if I did anything wrong. Oh, unknown scan, uh, dash C. So it's CH, sorry, I messed that up. So the command would be CH one to 11. Let's see if that runs. There we go, okay. So we're now running a scan from channels one to 11. It's supposed to run for about 30 seconds. And it's supposed to also spend a couple seconds on each channel. It's worth noting it would also show hidden networks. Yes, it will also show hidden networks. Because people think, oh, I just turned my Wi-Fi to hidden and no one can possibly see it. This is actually a terrible idea. Please do not use hidden networks. I mean, we will address that soon. Um, I actually i am hoping that we see a device probing for a hidden network because I love it when that happens. Okay, so. Ta-da, we have a probe request. So our scan has revealed a device calling out for a network it has connected to in the past. That's alarming. What if that's a private place you didn't want everyone to know that you worked or went to? That seems like a big information leak, right? Well, that's what the people at JPL thought when I showed them, um, because I made a little JPL detector and every time an employee walked through the door, it set off a little alarm. And it started happening so consistently that they asked me like, what was triggering it? And I told them their office Wi-Fi network. If their phone attempted to join when they walked in, it would set off a little, a little alarm. So this obviously concerned like government contractors who were like, wait, so you can just look on the internet, thanks to war driving, which I again, I think is funny and here's why, you can find the exact name of an office Wi-Fi network and then spoof it using what we're about to do and then watch when their device automatically attempts to join it. That's a huge information leak. So not only can we potentially actually gain control of their data connection, we can also determine where they've been. So we're gonna run a couple different commands that allow us to create both a fake access point, like a complete access point you can join and potentially fish people from, and we're also going to just create up to 50, I believe, fake networks that cause devices uh, devices nearby to react. So, all right, we can also see that these are organized in two different menus. And we can, in future commands, address different networks we've found or different devices that we found in a scan by either addressing them by their station number, in this case, zero, one, or two, or their access point number, in this case, zero, one, two, all the way to 18. So that's really useful if you don't want to copy and paste a giant MAC address. Uh, because you can also do it manually, but frankly, I think that's very annoying and, and just frankly, not something I wanna do. So, let's go ahead and take a look at the next thing we're gonna look at. Oh, actually, let me do one more scan for just stations and see what we get. So I'm gonna modify this and do scan. Actually, I'm gonna just type help. All right, scan-m. 
and then ST. And what I'm telling it to do is I just want to see stations. I don't want to mess around with access points. Now it's actually already run a scan and has stored the access points. And the reason for that is I'm not going to know who's connected to what if I don't have a list of access points um, while I'm scanning for stations. Mm. Dash C. Oh, right. I have to change that to CH. So the command in this case is scan dash T 30 dash CT, that's channel time, one second, and then dash CH 1 to 11. Let's see if that one works. There we go. Yep. Oh, I pasted. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Magic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, super secret network. <laughs> so we can see um, more information about devices that are attempting to connect to access points they've joined in the past. So this is really useful for a number of things. Uh, has anybody heard of a karma attack? Anybody? Cool. OK, I'm glad I get to introduce this. So a karma attack is going to be a core part of the Wi-Fi self-defense concept because it's probably the easiest attack to run. We're kind of running it manually, but there's a lot of devices that will run this automatically because it is so easy. So a karma attack exists to basically listen for these devices calling out for the last access point they've connected to. And sometimes they'll call out for a lot of them at the same time. And then it's just like, I'm here. And it will basically create a, a network in response to all of these devices calling out to see if that network is nearby. And if it happens to be an open network, the device will often automatically connect and allow a man in the middle position. So that means any website you load could be modified. They can redirect your DNS request to load arbitrary websites and make it so that anything you type into the browser is either like you know key logged or hooked or otherwise compromised. That sucks. And not knowing whether or not your device is selling you out by naming all of these different networks that you've joined in the past that don't have a password is a really big deal when it comes to making sure that your devices don't get taken over without you knowing. So I've uh, worked with a lot of uh, very fun experts who have had to explain this to journalists, and this is one of their favorite techniques, is using vulnerabilities in Wi-Fi to figure out how to like use their office Wi-Fi network to force their device to connect and push a malicious update or something like that. And as soon as they do that, you know, it pops up on their computer. This is a journalist or someone who's not super savvy with the way these updates work, and it looks legit. It has their company logo on it. It's like, this is a managed device. Please, you know, install this update. And it keeps coming up every time they try to go to, go to a website. I'm like, oh, my organization is doing an update. They're not going to call and ask. They're just going to install it. You know, so being able to make stuff pop up on someone's screen and make it look legit is a really big deal. And that's what this attack allows you to do. And that's why it's really important when you're looking at like hygiene for devices, open Wi-Fi networks, when you think about what they provide, it saves you like 10 seconds of clicking on the thing and connecting to it. And it's usually really easy to disable this option. If you're gonna teach the people in your life like one thing from this course that's easy to do is just don't save open Wi-Fi networks. It's not worth it. Um, if they can also not save hidden networks, I would consider that a personal favorite. Uh, favor, sorry, because hidden, if you join a hidden network, it will basically forever call it out because it's always looking for that network. If, if anybody wants to try it and is brave, um, just don't do it on, on an iPhone because it actually wasn't possible to delete these until you were in range of the network until literally like three months ago. I was blown away. So I devised an attack where I made a QR code that had a hidden network encoded in it, and your phone doesn't warn you that it's a hidden network when you when you scan it, and it just tags your phone like an animal. <laughs> and it basically just starts putting out that network name like every five to 10 seconds. So I can just make a scanner that's just listening for devices calling that out, and I could like, I raised it, was like you could put it at like a protest or an event or something, and anybody that scans it thinking they're getting free Wi-Fi is actually getting tagged as having been there. So there's a lot of, and the additional thing is you could then use the fact that that device is connected before to know that they're vulnerable to popping up a fake network and having them just join it. Their device won't even ask them or confirm because they've already said they trust that network. So Wi-Fi networks are powerful. They allow a lot of trust to the device because it's literally the way the user gets all their information. It's how everything's loaded. Um, some people are more hardened. They use VPNs. It's harder to mani manipulate their, their traffic. I use VPNs to prevent these sorts of local attacks. That's the only reason. I don't really see much other like value for them because I don't do anything I'm scared of people seeing. I just know that if I'm using a VPN, most of these attacks will not work. So that would be my two pieces of advice. Make sure you don't have any open Wi-Fi networks on your phone or any other critical devices that will allow someone to first discover it in a karma style attack and react to it. And then 
if you're going to do it anyway, just use a VPN because at least it will, it will protect your local traffic from being replaced with something else that could have you update your computer and end up backdooring it. And that happens a lot, especially to people that are either interested or working in cybersecurity. I don't know if you heard about uh, the dude that got his Plex server popped and then ended up taking out like LastPass, um, but it happens a lot. So, all right. Um, moving on, I'm gonna type help, and we're gonna skip over some of the more advanced things that don't quite apply to uh, the self-defense side of things, but I wanna touch on them a little bit. Um, one of them is authentication. So authentication scans allow us to see which devices are trying to connect to what network. So that's really interesting if we wanna see, for example, an automated connection confirming our suspicions that somebody has, in fact, connected to that network in the past. We're going to use it in tandem with creating a fake network to see which one of our fake networks cause probably people in the class to automatically connect. RSSI is, let's do that next. So RSSI is one of the more useful things I'm gonna teach you today because in terms of detecting um, unwanted network <laughs> devices, this is gonna be your number one function. So um, what does that mean? We could be talking about you uh, do a network scan and you, there's some random ass device on it that your neighbor is probably your neighbor or someone you gave your Wi-Fi password like one time or something. Um, and you don't know how they got on there. Maybe your router's vulnerable or whatever, but you have zero proof of who it is. How do you prove it? Well, this will be the command that we'll show you. Another example would be you go to an Airbnb and you do a little scan of their network and there's like an IoT device that's like kind of strong, but you can't see it anywhere and it's starting to concern you. If you want to find where it is, maybe it's a camera or something, this would be the way that you can locate the actual source of the signal. So lots of devices use 2.4 gigahertz. The fact that this is using the same internal chip that most of these IoT devices is an, is an advantage because we can use it to hunt down its brethren. So what we can do is after running a scan, we can address one of these access points or one of these client devices and we can continually output the signal strength. That's what RSSI is indicating, the signal strength. So let's go ahead and try it. I'm going to say, I feel like the super secret network is just inviting a response. So I'm going to, actually, no, let's go ahead and start this on uh, something that has a specific channel, because I think that's a better example. So I can see super secret network is here taunting me, and it is access point number three. So if I want to address it, if I want to start sniffing the strength of the packets coming from this, I need to know two things. One is either its MAC address, its number on this list, and the second is the channel that it's operating on. So if I'm skipping around and like on every channel and I don't tell this device what channel to listen to, I'm gonna get packets every couple seconds and my accuracy for sniffing stuff is gonna suck. I'm gonna have to really like sit there and wait for it to like load and see the difference. So you will get terrible results with this. If you don't first do a scan, identify what channel the target's operating on, and then we're gonna create a, uh, I'll type help, RSSI, we're gonna create a command to track down a device that we think is suspicious. In this case, the super secret network has piqued my curiosity. So we can see RSSI. Next, we can either use a MAC address or an AP value. In this case, we're talking about, on my scan anyway, AP3. So AP3, we know that it's operating on channel one. And I think that's just about all we gotta do. I'm, we'll see if it runs. There we go. So we can see the average number of packets per second we're receiving, nine packets is pretty good. And then we can see this visual indication of how strong the signal strength is. Now if I wasn't connected to an HDMI cable, I could walk around the room and I could identify which device this is by which one fills up the bar, essentially. Now RSSI is inverted, but when you look at the signal strength, I really, it's, this is not how it works, but the way I explain it to total beginners is it's like this is the percent of signal loss. So like if you see like 10% 10, 10 signal loss, it means you're basically on top of it. Whereas if you're seeing like 100, like 90%, you're as far away as it could basically receive. So that's why I had the developer explicitly create this bar, because I got tired of explaining that. And I was just like, when the bar fills up, you found it. So this could be your neighbor's wall, where you realize that their Roku has suddenly joined your network and like that's why your gaming's so slow. Or it could be like, I don't know, like one of those sneaky like, sh like light bulbs that is actually a camera. Those exist, and they use this chipset generally to connect back. So that's why this kind of ability to find IoT devices and identify them um, just from signal strength is super, super powerful. And there's more advanced ways to do this. If you really wanted to like make a habit of this, you could use a directional antenna, which means 
uh, this is like a lamp. It basically has omnidirectional coverage, and you got to kind of play hot and cold with it in order to find um, where the device is. If you were to use a directional antenna, like a Yagi antenna or something that searches like a spotlight, you, you can stand in one position and sweep and immediately identify where the device is. So this is a really interesting, like radio frequency hunting, this is called fox hunting, is like a hacker sport. Like there's a lot of conferences where people will hide foxes like all over the place and you'll have to track them down and I, like they'll be in like potted plants and other like weird places. And it's a lot of fun because this is like a whole thing that people really enjoy doing and is uh, kind of like a geocaching thing too. So it's a good skill to have. Your new Nugget can now do this. And the original version of uh, the Nugget does not have this ability. So super cool and that's why we use the command line. Also, has anyone else's Nugget turned pink? On the back. On the back. A little bit. Yeah. So these uh, 3D printed cases are actually color changing. Um, we They were also printed by the library, so a big round of applause uh, for making these. Uh, they're so cute and so fun. We bought a bunch of like goth ones that were like substantially less cute, but I hope you appreciate these because they'll heat up from both your hand and also as they kind of get started heating up, they you can see where the microcontroller is kind of getting hot and uh, maybe let you know when your nugget needs a rest if it turns completely pink. <laughs> pink nugget needs a nap. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. The pink nugget need, needs a nap. All right, when does it, how much time do we have? When are we, when is our cutoff? Is it, I completely agree. I schedule it until the library closes at 8. Hooray. Okay, cool. Then let's keep going. Yeah, you got like two hours. All right, so does anybody have any questions about RSI? RSI? Um, just, uh, just a general question. Um, could you open up a text pad on the side and put your commands? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Because they disappear. So Sure can. In fact, I have a um, kind of a cheat sheet that I am compiling from this because I find that having a working example is the the most important thing. You know, because then after that you can riff on it, see what breaks it or not. It's just very frustrating if nothing runs. I will put that right here. So I have some other examples of stuff we're going to do also here that I just want to run guaranteed, and you are. I will try to share this link as well so everyone has access to it. Um, all right. So we're going to talk about beacons. So we've done everything completely passive so far. Everything we've done is not interacting really um, with devices. We're, we're purely listening in and kind of getting information from that. Let's mix it up. So we're going to work with two different types of fake networks. We cannot provide an inter internet connect. Oh, actually, okay, that's not true. This, this little microcontroller can actually act as a, a NAT router, which is really cool. It can basically flip its stupid little like Wi-Fi radio back and forth like super fast and connect to a router and then extend that into an access point. But that's a separate project. We're not gonna cover that today. So I won't <laughs> say that it can't provide internet. It actually can. I've watched YouTube videos on it. It's very slow. Um, but it does have a lot of abilities and we've used, used it as a punching bag in networking classes as an example of a router that you can just mess with. And if it bursts into flames, like who cares? Like go get a new one, you know? Um, so. Let's talk about the different types of fake networks that we can create. The first one are going to be beacons. So the analogy I gave for this is beacons are like a billboard for a store with no store behind it. It describes what's in the store, how fast the transactions are, like what currency the transactions are in, and basically what's supported, but it does not actually need to have the resources of an access point behind it. Those are substantial. You have to like do DHCP stuff, it sucks, it's, it sucks. So instead, if we just want to pop up that billboard, the way that all of your devices decide what networks are around and, and potentially try to join them is just by running a continuous scan and looking for these beacon frames. So if we want to provide misinformation, there is a problem with beacon frames, and that is that they are completely unauthenticated and anybody can spoof whatever they want in them. There's no way that you can tell where they came from, and it is super easy to make the fake so convincing that both routers and devices have no idea who, who is saying who they are. Now that is the fundamental problem behind deauthentication attacks. It's essentially a valid command that the router can send that's not encrypted and it's not authenticated. So anybody can send it and knock somebody off the network. The same is true with beacon frames. Now if you're interested in this, there's actually a lot of really sneaky, cool, bleeding edge attacks uh, in beacon frames that are just coming out where you can just tell someone that the network power is like essentially zero and it'll just turn the person's power down all the way until they can barely transmit. There's also some attacks where it messes up the amount of time that each device waits before transmitting to avoid you know, talking over each other so that it waits so long that neither device will speak. So it just creates silence on the, on the network. 
these are like kind of edge cases and again like not very well documented right now because they're kind of just coming out but there's a lot of stuff that's wrong with beacon frames and they will continue to be wrong for many years so um, enjoy it because the next version of Wi-Fi WPA3 has fixed a lot of these problems they still have some pretty hilarious problems um, but not anything as bad as what we currently live with which is WPA2 current standard that has all these fun gags we can play so let's do some stuff with beacons I'm gonna type help Beacon. All right, and we get information. So there's a lot here. So we can specify the SSID. That's the name of the network. And this is the most important thing. At its most simple, we can type beacon. Do, let's see, Google Starbucks. And this is going to create an open Wi Fi network called Google Starbucks on an arbitrary channel. And it's going to pick a random MAC address. If you check, uh, start scanning on any one of your local devices, you should see a network that pops up with this. It might take a little bit, but if you attempt to connect to it, nothing's gonna happen. There's a, this is a billboard, it's, it's misinformation. Your device is thinking that there's a network here, but it's a ghost. So if it were to try to connect, the only thing it would really do is reveal to me that you wanna join that network or that it's automatically stored in your phone. So that's the foundation of most of what we're about to do next. So um, I, Let's go ahead, well, let's make it a little bit more advanced before we try it ourselves. So I'm gonna type help beacon, and let's see what else we can do. So typically, it'll just pick a random MAC address, that's the BSS ID. If you want to spoof a vendor, this could be important. So if you wanna impersonate a device, or if you want to make someone think a certain kind of device is here, my favorite is a Lockheed Martin Tactical Networks device. Nobody likes to see that MAC address or vendor on their network or near their network. So if you arbitrarily create it, it is very funny because networking people have to figure out what the fuck is going on. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so if you want to like spoof the device of like NASA or a federal contractor, like it is absolutely uh, like alarming and funny to do so. And it's, as far as I know, not a crime. Um, just don't connect to networks that you don't have permission to do. But like pretending that there's like heavy NSA equipment rolling through your neighborhood, like it's going to make like the networking nerd in your neighborhood like just post on Reddit all day. And all of those MAC addresses are public information. You can just look up MAC vendor IDs. Yes, yes, you absolutely can. Um, so another interesting thing is um, you can, and I did not know this until very recently, um, you can uh, cast type people by sending these networks only to one device. So I did not know this, but beacons are not necessarily a protocol that goes to everyone. You can actually specify a recipient of this and every other device will drop it. So what does that mean? One person is gonna get a super weird, super strong network and no one else can see it, so nobody else probably believes them. Um, this is one way you can do targeted phishing, for example. So like if you were seeing a bunch of networks that like only your device sees but nobody else sees, that could be the reason why. But just be aware that if someone comes to you with this problem, it is a real thing that people can do to expose only a single device or a couple devices to uh, a, particular, a particular network. So um, the encryption, that's whether or not this has a password or not. This doesn't even let you set the password because it doesn't matter. Nobody's connecting to it anyway. There's no network behind here. We're not doing any authentication. So like, why even bother setting a password? It doesn't matter. Just tell it what type of password it's pretending to have, and that's what we'll slap on the billboard. Next yeah. up, we have the... Huh? Does it do WPA3? Because it only says WPA3. I seriously doubt it. Okay. I seriously doubt it. Um, hopefully in future updates. I know the chip actually does support it, but I don't think the software currently does. Um, you can select the rate. Uh, and then you can also uh, set the channel. So channel usually just sets arbitrarily. Um, it's useful though to set this channel deliberately and the reason for that is just discoverability. If you're gonna set a channel, set it to one, six, or 11. The reason for that is every other channel on the Wi-Fi, on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum actually overlaps. Um, and that's why if you do a scan, you're gonna see pretty much every device cl clustered around those three channels. So if you're gonna set something up, just set it on those channels. Um, you're gonna get poor performance on other ones, so it's just kind of best practices. All right, so let's also explore this last one. The dash auth is authentication. That was a command we just talked about very, very lightly, but it wasn't very useful for us because we weren't looking for anybody authenticating with anything in particular. Now we are. So if we're going to put up this billboard, the dash auth command lets us see if devices are trying to connect to it. Because normally we're not keeping track of that. Like when I'm creating this Google Starbucks, like. I'm not keeping track if anybody is connecting to it or anything else. So let's go ahead and try to create a fake network and then get alerted when somebody tries to connect back to it. So I'm gonna copy it directly from the example I got to work last night, but this is it. I beaconed fake net, 
channel one, and you have to specify the channel, and dash off. And I'm going to run this and see if it works. And I will also ask for a volunteer who is oh, ask for a volunteer who is brave enough to uh, attempt to connect to that network, and we'll see if we get a response when they do. Oops, there we go. Okay, so we have sprung a trap. If anybody has joined FakeNet in the past, which I have repeatedly, uh, so it might be me, then we might see a result. Also last night, I was getting, oh, there we go. Somebody has done it. So we can see that somebody with this MAC address has either joined or is obeying my instructions and attempting to join FakeNet. And what that means is we can start to create more filters. Now, as a hacker, I used to ride the LA subway and just enjoy the fact that there was actually no cell phone reception. So everybody's Wi-Fi devices were going crazy looking for networks at their highest power, spewing out every network they've ever joined. And I would just make a survey of all the most popular networks in the city and see which elicited the most response. So imagine in like 10 or 15 seconds, you can be a room with 50 people and find out which one network can make 25 of those people automatically connect to your network. It's really cool. It's super cool. Now here's how you have some fun with this. If you ever go to a concert or a big event and whatever, and you know a couple networks that locally are super popular, Google Starbucks is a good place to start. Turn your VPN onto another country, create an access point that you know that they're going to join, and most devices will automatically join because it's the most convenient place to get data, and all of their websites will start loading in another language. It's the easiest way to demonstrate this to lay people or let them know how, how simple it is to figure this out and switch their connection so it impacts them. It actually changes what they see. People don't get that this process is basically allowing a hacker to change what you see, but the VPN trick sure gets the point across real fast. Because once everything's in Italian, it gets real confusing to find the exit to the venue. You know, it's... <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna stop this. And that is most of what I wanna show about beacons. The authentication allows us to also present a big list. So this is a list of the most popular networks in Los Angeles based on about a year of war driving around. And if you have an Android device, I invite you to try this. You can download an app called Wiggle Wi-Fi that will use the phone's wireless radio and GPS to geolocate every cell tower, every Wi-Fi network, and every Bluetooth device as you go about your, your day and map it. Super cool because you can do statistics and find out like, oh, what are the top 10 open Wi-Fi networks in my area? And odds are most of the devices in your area are gonna connect to that because they've been to that coffee shop, they've been to that store before, they've sat at that McDonald's, they've been Jack's guest. You know, like these are all really popular uh, Wendy's guest network, uh, hotels, like other things that people will have stayed at. And these major brands, these major chains are super, super easy to do scans for. So I'm gonna copy this really big command I'm gonna run it, and I think that you will see an explosion of suspicious Wi-Fi networks that definitely do not belong in Missoula. All right, there we go. So look at all these networks we're creating simultaneously. This is one device creating the Hollywood Pominin Suites, the JW Marriott, Jack's guest. Oh, FBI surveillance man, city of Los Angeles guest. That doesn't belong here. <laughs> so the trick behind this is they're billboards. We're not consuming that much power by transmitting arbitrary packets that are formatted in this way. It means we can really be pretty sneaky. I'm gonna, so I, my phone is now attempting to connect to AT&T Wi-Fi, and I can see it's uh, actually not showing the SSID, that's interesting. Oh, there we go. So we can see that my phone has connected to a guest before and it is revealing itself. Um, and this is an automatic process. I'm not, usually, you would not have the person be tapping buttons and, and connecting. Their phone would automatically be like, oh sweet, the library network shares. Oh, you're by the Motel 6. Because when a phone stores a network or a laptop stores a network, there's no geo information. It doesn't even store the MAC address. Why? Situations like this library. If your phone saw a different network for every access point that's powering this, this Wi-Fi in the library for all these floors, it would get overwhelmed and it would be really confusing. So that's why this sort of information is super, super useful and we can use these sorts of beacon, I call them a beacon swarm, to figure out like what one or two networks will cause the most devices to react. So um, this is good for statistics. Um, I did uh, like a bunch of just like breakdowns of like what were the most popular networks, what, what brands of devices were most vulnerable to these types of attacks, and it turns out Apple devices and like Huawei devices for some reason really like just going for any network. And they're pre-programmed with carrier networks. So included in this list, is uh, some carrier specific networks like AT&T or T-Mobile 
these are hardwired into devices and often can't be deleted because guess what? They want to save money on data. So if you're near one of their branded Wi-Fi, they want the phone to automatically connect and they don't want you to have the ability to get rid of it. So it's a little difficult um, to stay completely impervious to these kinds of attacks because there are you know, the vendors of the phones kind of working against you, like building in these things that make it harder to stay secure and make sure that you don't get taken for a ride by one of these fake Wi-Fi networks. But revealing where you've been can also be a big deal, depending on where you work. And that's why my demo really freaked out some defense contractors, when they're like, wait, this costs $1.80 for the core board, like you could just have this sitting you know, next to something and, and determine who works at Boeing, who works at like Lockheed Martin, like that's alarming, but that's just the way this network works. So, all right, that's gonna be our beacon swarm portion. Um, this is some research that I worked on for the last two years, mostly at the expense of commuters on the LA subway, so or one after them. <laughs> but do you have any questions about the way this works, or do you have any questions about how this could be applied? Or how to stay safe from it? Either you're lying or I've been very clear. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and take a look at some more commands. So I'm going to stop this. Um, so if you're ever going to be doing a demonstration that's streamed or live um, and it's in your house, I just told you about war driving, right? What's the logical conclusion about leaking your own MAC address now on the internet? People leave in my comments my address all the time. <laughs> they, they, and they're just like, look, and it's like, I, I wardrobe that. Like, if you want to come to that part of Los Angeles, it's a really bad area, so like, <laughs> that's on you. But like, I get nonstop people telling me about this. So, if you're doing a demo on this or whatever, there is a demo mode built into this that will obscure the MAC addresses to make it harder for people to do this. Um, it's a big concern for me, maybe not a big concern for you, but I just wanted you to not dox yourselves if you're gonna be controversial and then like do a demo like this, because uh, I've learned it the hard way by people just posting a multiple. They always feel like they're telling me something. Like, I know I live there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, now's a good time to get into chicken. Can everybody please just type the word chicken into their uh, console? There you go. That's purely for morale. <laughs> Enjoy. Um, this is just if you find yourself getting overwhelmed or stressed out, this is, this is to let you chill out a little bit and just remember it's not that serious. Okay, so the final, I believe, um, thing we're gonna get into is access points. So now we're gonna forego the billboard and we're actually gonna stand up something that devices can connect to. And this is where we get into things like DNS spoofing and um, captive portals. So I have a story to tell of how I got my company, um, I don't think we got hacked, I think we just gave some dude free Wi-Fi for like a year. Um, and what happened was, I was at the startup, and it was a mixed use startup, so like the upstairs were fancy apartments, the downstairs were businesses, and uh, we had just moved in, all of our networking stuff was new, and our Wi-Fi stopped working for a day. And I got a, like, an open Wi-Fi network that had the exact same network as ours, which was not working, and I was just like, what is going on? So I connected to it, concerned, of course, that our, our Wi-Fi network was suddenly open. And I got a pop-up that said, your router has updated an important security update and needs your password to reboot. And I was like, okay. So I like clicked out of it, I tried to join the network again, it didn't work, and it's just like, this thing, is, this thing is broken. So I applied the update and felt very good about myself for how I had kept our company safe by frequently updating our IoT devices. And in fact, that was a phishing attack. Somebody was deauthenticating our network popping up an open network that just had the same name, and I didn't know enough about what it looked like that I just gave them our password. Now, like, that startup was doomed anyway, so, like, I don't think it did any damage. I think literally <laughs> just someone, you know, got free Wi-Fi from that, and good for them. But when we're talking about the kinds of things that you might encounter when you're just out there working with technology that you don't always have a lot of time on, it's really easy to forget what requires trust and what requires absolutely no trust, no authentication, nothing. I should have known better that an open Wi-Fi network with no encryption and merely the same name as the network I was connected to was not necessarily the right one. And I could have just connected via Ethernet and investigated the situation, but I was involved in research and marketing, not in IT. So I did not care, and we didn't have an IT people because there were like eight people in that company. So most of the time that people get taken by this, it's in moments of stress where you're focused on another job and where like this is not your primary responsibility. That's it. That's how it happens most of the time. So um, creating an access point is a powerful thing. As I just demonstrated, doing that alone can get you the Wi-Fi network password on most medium to small business networks. Um, and what you would find on those networks will blow your hair back. Um, 
it's crazy. So small, medium-sized businesses are particularly vulnerable to this, uh, and if you work at one, which I imagine some of you do, um, this is like what they have to balance because they don't care. They're just struggling to survive. Like this is not a money maker for them. So abusing the way people trust technology, like that is the number one way that this kind of spins out of control for people who are interacting with it and are very important, but maybe don't have the right training. So we're gonna hopefully get you some right training so you don't fall for it like I did. So let's see how easy it is to do this. So let's type help AP. and we'll see all the core commands that we can run. So this is our trade-off for not having a friendly like access point that lets us connect and, and run some basic attacks. Like We're giving that up so we can create an access point that is instead evil. So looking at the things we can set, we can set the name of the network, and this time we can actually set a password. We couldn't before because there was no ability to connect, but this time we're creating a single network and we are actually putting together the, the backend infrastructure to make people able to connect. So we do need to set a password if we want this network to look like it's password protected. We can also set this to a hidden uh, network if we want to. I don't want to, um, but if you wanted to do that, then you could. Uh, and then you can also uh, do, oh, well, so let me explain the utility of that. So if you did want to create a hidden network, the, the way that that would be sneaky is, let's say that I have a bunch of coworkers who are a bit more savvy than, than I am and I am creating a network in response to a probe request I saw, so I know that your coworker went to Denny's, and I'm creating the Denny's network, but I make it a hidden network. Sometimes a phone will warn people and say, like, the last time this was joined, it wasn't hidden, now it is, like, are you sure you want to confirm? But sometimes it won't, and it might give me the advantage that, like, maybe nobody else sees the network, but again, I could also send it directed, so I could send it specifically to that Denny's guy, and nobody else would see it anyway, so I've just kind of talked myself out of any use case for using the hidden flag, just don't use it. You can, you can just send a, a directed thing so only one person sees it and it's probably better. Next up is channel. We have to set that. Again, I would do channel one, channel six, or channel 11. And then we can set a VSS ID or a MAC address. Now, the reason again is we can spoof a vendor. What are the odds that you wake up with an Aruba router and suddenly you see an open network from a Netgear router and that's yours? Probably pretty low. I don't think that your router like morphed in the middle of the day. It's probably someone who just let this pick a random BSS ID. And if you're a savvy networking person, you would be concerned and confused to see that like there was a mismatch between like what it was presenting itself as and then like what the MAC address was. It would be confusing, right? Like if you've got like a Cisco router and it's like giving you a net Netgear interface, that's a big red flag. And that's actually where I should have gotten uh, the first hint that I was getting taken because it presented a super generic interface. It had no idea what type of router I was using. So from a self-defense perspective, when you get something like this popping up or you get a, an interface that's like, oh, you need to update your router and it's the wrong brand, it's the wrong vendor, that is a big red flag. That is in fact the biggest red flag. You just shouldn't proceed any further because that's the mistake that most people make. They don't bother with the details. And in this case, the details could be the language, the details could be the, the vendor, or it could be something more specific. So looking for inconsistencies in especially, especially open networks, like if you're joining the library and all the different networks are from the same vendor except one, odds are that maybe somebody's creating a rogue access point and that's the one because they just didn't bother to set this detail. So a lot of tools are automated. Like we're, we're gonna go through the process where if you don't specifically set this flag, it's just gonna pick a random one. So that is how a lot of amateurs get caught. They don't go into the details and they don't make sure that they could withstand a second glance from someone who knows that you know the, the, the vendor of the MAC address should match the vendor of the page that's popping up if they're gonna pick one. So let's go ahead and create an access point. And I'm gonna leave it to, to random for now just because I, I don't particularly care which vendor we set, but I'm gonna do AP, this is, and I can use quotes to do things with spaces in them if that's necessary, if you want to. Um, this is also positional, so I'm gonna see if this fails, but because it's a positional argument, I don't think you have to explicitly set the dash S flag if you don't want to. We'll see if this fails, I could be very wrong, let's try it. I'm also gonna do dash P, password, one, two, three, and dash CH, one. Okay, that worked. So it was a positional argument. I set the password, password one, two, three. It's located on channel one. And if I were to join this, which, am I doing anything that's gonna get messed up or am I not getting internet? I don't care, whatever. Well, it's, it's a live demo. So I'm gonna do a little scan. I'm connecting. Oh, look at that. All right, so we've, we're fishing Michael. Michael has now, uh, do you have a captive portal? Yeah. Can you show it? 
hold it up, hold it up. Yeah, yeah so this is so the, on a mobile <laughs> device, and I encourage you to create an access point and connect to your own so you can see it pop up. Most of the time, it will give you this pretty official looking captive portal. So go ahead and spin up your own access point. Please make a unique name, don't copy mine, and a different password so you're sure that you're connecting to your own device. And from whatever router, or sorry, from whatever laptop or phone you want to, you can connect and see what, what it does. In most cases, the operating system will open a very official looking captive portal that overlays over everything and makes you think like the phone is kind of approving of the situation. It, it kind of gives the default impression that like this is something that's permitted. So I'm gonna try connecting here. You fished my password. Oh yeah, yeah, so let's, let's see what this looks like. Other network, this is real. Hello class, nice. So all of this is being kind of sucked down and then displayed on the screen by the microcontroller. What is happening here? Oh, okay, so here we go. Mac OS has detected a captive portal and in an attempt to be helpful has overlaid this over my screen all big and official. Look at that. So we worked very hard to make this captive portal suck. No one is going to get taken or convinced by this example we're placing into your hands. But the operating system thinks it's really important for you to see it, huh? So if I type in then, my secret password and hit submit, of course the attacker gets it right here. So this is the fundamentals of a Wi-Fi phishing attack. You're using someone's kind of unfamiliarity with Wi-Fi and the fact that the operating system makes it so damn official. It really looks like this is something you're supposed to interact with before continuing. It creates urgency, it creates the illusion of authority, and if the phishing page is really good, you will see people breeze through this because it looks really, it looks like you're supposed to complete it. You know, it looks like an assignment that's popped up for you. So the fact that the operating system plays along is really the core of this attack. Sometimes you'll find certain devices that are fussy about this um, and sometimes flashing your device again will help. Sometimes it's just like a weird incompatibility. The number one thing that I learned that freaked me out about Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi is not one monolith. Every vendor implements Wi-Fi slightly differently and different flavors of Wi-Fi have different quirks. So sometimes you'll just find two that just don't work very well together and it's just impossible to understand why unless you realize that Wi-Fi is a list of suggestions and vendors are required to, to follow basically like 80% of the rules. And which ones they pick and choose, some are mandatory, some are optional, but that creates a lot of confusion in the way that some devices might interact. Yeah, I, I would also note it's very easy for an attacker to look at the MAC address, see what the vendor ID of your router is, and then make that page appear as if it's that vendor. So you're like, oh, okay, this is my Cisco router just demanding a password. Yeah. Yeah, and technology needs to be updated so often and people are so numb to like these sorts of requests that just pounding in your password in response to a prompt, like unless it's really sketchy or unreasonable, mm -hmm. We've, everybody knows about ChatGPT now. There's there's no misspelled phishing pages anymore unless someone's like barely trying. So at this point, like you really have to expect that these sorts of phishing pages are gonna look super good. They're gonna look really, really good. So as people that are both trying to defend yourselves and potentially defending other people, like you need to let them know that these levels of trust, like you can't just take an open Wi-Fi network and assume that it's coming from somewhere reputable. You really need to like assume a certain level of risk because a password does give you some level of surety that you're connecting to the right network, yeah, unless it's publicly shared. If it's a coffee shop and everybody has the Wi-Fi password, you basically get the same situation as an open Wi-Fi network. So the password being a secret is really the only thing holding security get together here when it comes to like Wi-Fi networks. So um, yeah, that's the majority, yeah? Is it kind of only detecting like Apple products? It should detect everything. My Android phone works. Um, have you tried creating like a, a like your own network and then connecting on an Android phone? Yeah. So, but like when he does, connects to mine with an Apple product, it, it works. The when I try it, I try it. I didn't try it to your what type device. of a, what type of Android phone do you have? Uh, Fragmentation, my friend. They, they just use a slightly different Wi-Fi chipset. So well, what I mentioned about different vendors having different flavors of Wi-Fi, yeah. some of them will be like, this is incompatible, or like this, I can't connect to this. Last night when we were doing testing, Samsung devices were some of the ones that struggled to connect to some of these microcontroller generated networks because they used a slightly different flavor of Wi-Fi that wasn't working well with these particular microcontrollers. Would it be because it's like trying to connect over a 5 gigahertz? That could be, um, I mean it definitely won't work if it tries to connect over five gigahertz, yeah. but um, I guess what I'm saying is sometimes we see these sorts of collisions where a certain vendor 
like can't connect to an access point or has unusual problems, and it's because each vendor picks which rules of Wi-Fi it wants to follow, and it just has a couple mandatory ones that kind of hold everything together. But because like Samsung may not support some features, for example, that IoT devices use or implement it differently, we get like weird variations like this. However, I also have seen just reflashing the device fix it. Like a small percentage of these, like flashing them again, just managed to fix like an incompatibility issue that we experienced last night that was basically the same thing. When we tried to connect, it just said cannot connect to Wi-Fi network. The other thing that does that is if you don't specify a channel, it will fail like that. So, uh, I specify the channel on here. Yeah. No, on your microcontroller. So if you're already specifying a channel, then you're pretty you're doing you're doing everything right. Yeah. I would try reflashing because that solves just mysteriously 80% of issues. All right, so at this point, we've gone through a lot of different attacks. We've talked about how you can listen in and discover infrastructure and craft attacks around maybe a particularly valuable target. We've also talked about passively taking that list of access points and clients and physically tracking any of them down. So if we're talking about like a hidden camera, a neighbor stealing your Wi-Fi connection, or a device that you don't understand what it is, and maybe it doesn't belong in your network, that is something that, abs oh, we can see requests going out too, that's funny. Um, <laughs> uh, we can learn lots of information about devices around us just through passive reconnaissance and reading like the signal strength of something. So that's gonna apply for IoT devices, that's gonna apply for a lot of different stuff. So what's going on here, by the way? Like somebody is connected to this network and their computer is making DNS requests. So if we were to sit here for long enough, we would actually see, so somebody's using a too, because um, that's canonical. So what we're basically doing is sitting in a man in the middle position and we can eventually figure out what apps they're running on their phone and what types of software they have, doing updates and pinging, maybe even what websites they're visiting. Websites are a little bit more tricky because we have HTTPS, but DNS requests are not generally, usually encrypted. So now that, I mean, they're not gonna get anything because we're not providing a network connection, just getting ourselves into the position where we're able to have somebody connected to our phishing page, even if they don't click on it, we still get a list of all the software potentially running on their phone. Interesting to know what dating apps people on the same, you know, like in the coffee shop with you are running, but this, that's the way that this works. You can, you can start seeing what types of apps or what types of websites people are like, I remember I was in college and I was doing this and I was like, who here is on Lively? Get out, like, you shouldn't be in here doing that. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting how these data leaks can happen that maybe either expose your Wi-Fi password by tricking you or potentially expose information about like what kinds of software you're running, maybe if it's vulnerable. Um, those are all things that you might be worried about. The last thing I'll mention, and I guess the final risk that I haven't really gone over is when you create an access point like this, you're allowing basically direct access to that device over the network. So if they have weird ports open, like a lot of developers run stuff and just leave like port 80s open on their laptop and other stuff like that. If you can trick someone into connecting one of these fake networks, you can do a scan on, on their device and start messing with their stuff. If they have SSH running, you can start brute forcing that. So that kind of like trust. So imagine, I'm sitting on a subway in LA. I find 50 people's phones that will connect to Google Starbucks. One of them is a developer that's running some weird stuff that's exposing a port 80 or SSH. I can like swim through that sea of, of internet connections, find the one person that's got something juicy and start attacking them. That's a lot of trust that our devices are kind of delegating away from us just by what network they keep stored in our phone. So I guess if I was to headline everything, it would be store the minimum amount of Wi-Fi networks in your phone as possible, make sure you delete ones that are open, and use a VPN not to keep all the sketchy stuff you do private, but to make sure that somebody who does manage to get your Wi-Fi connection, it's all encrypted, it doesn't give them any useful information. Don't connect to hidden networks. And don't connect to hidden networks. Or, and especially, don't scan random QR code networks um, because on iPhones anyway, it wasn't even possible to delete them until recently. So that would be my advice. Uh, does anybody have any questions, thoughts, or uh, concerns? Yeah, so when you're inputting a password, couldn't you technically like overflow the chip if by inputting uh, too long of a password? Probably. So these chips mm -hmm. are relatively limited in what they can do. You notice we don't have a lot of like song and dance going on with our phishing page. We could do it. And like I said, these are able to do to like limitedly connected data. So if you wanted to make a phishing page that was a version of this that was connected to a Wi-Fi network and was pulling images from a website so it's not actually storing it, you can get pretty sophisticated with them, but you can also crash them real easy. Because you're really like, you're really pushing it, like trying to make these little like dollar eighty cent microcontrollers like load full of websites. I see very frequently like I will make something that like for example forwards them to something that's hosted elsewhere or something like that. I've even done attacks where I merely get them to join the network, click on something, and then immediately kick off and have them 
join like a phishing page on their mobile data network because I could have them redirect and then disconnect immediately. So there's very sneaky ways you can use someone connecting to a network and then getting them to either forward to a, you know, a, a different website or a phishing page or something like that and then disconnect and for example, um, like tracking links are one thing that I think are really clever and cool, but you have to get someone to click on the link. If you get their device to join your Wi-Fi network, it goes to one of these like pop-up pages and you redirect it to the tracking link and disconnect. It basically gives you their carrier, the type of device they have. It's, it's pretty tricky, honestly. So there's a lot of sneaky stuff you can do with Wi-Fi. It's kind of my thing. So, so if you have any questions about potential attacks, interesting attacks, or further resources, if you want to learn more about these sorts of Wi-Fi vectors, I found networking is super accessible and relatively, okay, moderately easy to get started with. There's a lot of detail stuff, but it really explains a lot of the way that these attacks work, and it becomes kind of simple to visualize and understand, even taking like a CCNA class or, or something like that, like, or sorry, um, routing and switching, sorry, routing and switching class. Like, just taking a routing and switching class allowed me to develop some of these attacks, like using the microcontrollers and the way that they make fake networks. So most of this research is just poking around with like a failing a routing and switching class and seeing what this microcontroller is capable of doing in terms of weird behavior that's supposed to be for convenience, but instead like delegates the trust away from the user and, and into this dumb chip that's gonna decide to save data and like be convenient every time. That's about it. Um, we've got some extra time, so if you want to poke around with your nuggets, provided again you are not uh, deauthenticating, <laughs> we're here to answer any questions. And again, I'm also going to distribute this list of resources it's the class information, flashing a nugget, the serial interface, as well as examples of working commands that we went over. I imagine that would be very helpful. So I'll both um, put a link, however we're gonna distribute it. I'll, I'll try to shorten it somehow. And also leave this up in case anybody wants to try some stuff that's not disrupted. So also, again, a really big shout out to the library. This makerspace is interesting. Of course, no, the floor is yours. Um, part of what got our funding for everybody to get a nugget for free um, was I need to do a feedback survey in a couple weeks. And if you signed up through Eventbrite, I already have your email. Um, but if you didn't, if you could get me your email, and if you respond to that survey, that will make it more likely that we can secure funding for more classes like